Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're watching this. Um, we'd like to introduce you to the CNCF uh, tag storage session, where we're going to cover an intro to the tag, um, some of the projects we're working on, uh, and the landscape uh, and technology in our space. Uh, my name is uh, Alex Kirchhoff. Um, I'm the CEO of Storage OS, and I'm also a co-chair of the CNCF storage tag. Um, and my co-presenters are uh, Jing and Raphael, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Thanks, Alex. My name is Xing Yang. I work at VMware in the cloud storage team. I'm a co-chair of uh, Kubernetes Six Storage, also co-chair of the CNCF tag storage. And now it's uh, Raphael's turn. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rafael Espasoli. I work at Red Hat as an architect for OpenShift. I am also a lead in tag storage tag. Brilliant. So let's dive right in. Um, so very quickly today, we're going to cover um, an overview of the tag and some of the storage projects um, that are being worked on in the CNCF and that are being reviewed by the tag. Um, we'll also cover um, some of the documents uh, and content that we've been working on, including uh, the storage landscape documents, the performance and benchmarking, and the disaster recovery. As always, we're, we're aiming to have a few minutes at the end um, for, for Q&A, so feel free to post questions um, as we go along. So very quickly, um, this, the, the CNCF uh, tags are technical advisory groups. Um, they used to be called SIGs, um, but they were renamed because of some of the confusion um, with, with between the CNCF uh, SIGs and the Kubernetes SIGs. Um, all of our calls uh, are open. Um, we have meetings on the second and fourth uh, Wednesday of every month. Um, so please, uh, you're welcome to join and have a look at the, at the agenda and, uh, and, and join our mailing list. And all the recordings of, uh, of previous uh, tag sessions are also online on, on YouTube. Um, fundamentally, we're a mixed bunch of, of people um, verging from um, uh, you know, technologists and, and business users and vendors, um, but all specializing in, in storage. Um, we have a number of coaches that, that uh, manage and plan with the tag and a number of tech leads who are technical authorities in that space. Um, and we work with the TOC, um, specifically Saad Ali, who also used to be um, in, the, in the tag, and, and Aaron Boyd, who also used to be in the tag before they joined the, the TOC. Um, fundamentally, what we're here to do is to help the TOC scale. We're, we're here to provide technical expertise um, and, and sort of bring the, the storage community uh, into the CNCF. Um, a, a big portion of what we do is to create um, documents and, uh, and information which helps uh, end users understand the cloud native storage space, which is quite complex. And Jing will, will talk a little bit about um, some of the things we're doing there. Um, but of, of course, what we're trying to do here is, is lots of research. Um, and that kind of ties in then to the second thing we do, which is, which is projects. Um, today, uh, the CNCF has three types of projects. There are sandbox, incubation, and graduation. Sandbox projects is, is the starting point for, for a lot of the project's journey into the CNCF, um, and it allows them, uh, it has a low uh, barrier to entry and allows uh, um, uh, projects to, to build a, a community and, and, and start working towards their uh, intellectual intellectual property policies, whereas incubation projects are projects which um, happen after a due diligence step, and those incubation projects are uh, effectively used successfully in, in production and have um, a healthy number of committers um, and, and also a, a number of uh, users that, that, uh, that can vouch for, for the project. Graduation is, is for projects that have gone mainstream and, you know, things like uh, uh, Kubernetes, etcd, for example, and Prometheus are are some of the big uh, graduated projects, um, and they also benefit from uh, security audits and have um, committers from multiple organizations to ensure the, the a longer life of the project. Um, 
So the tag actually is um, uh, helps the TOC um, with the review process, and we perform the due diligence for projects that are going through um, due diligence um, reviews. And we typically work with uh, a, a sponsor from the TOC, um, who also uh, who also typically will have a, you know a, speci a specific interest in the project. Um, finally. A couple of other things that we do is we provide um, uh, we, we provide input from end users sometimes by for example running surveys and, and, and understanding end user use cases um, to to help prioritize what to work on next um, and to, to also provide that that feedback to to projects as needed um, and we and we also of course you know we've talked about the the, the meetings and the community that that um, that we're trying to build which 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 often has um, you know very interesting uh, discussions about a variety of topics, which then often end up becoming um, documents that we publish. And finally, of course, you know we're we're trusted advisors to the to the TOC. Um, but note, we don't actually make decisions on projects. We we provide advice and and recommendations, and ultimately, the TOC who are who are voted in make the make the final decisions um, for those for those projects. Um, and with that, I will hand over to Xing, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the projects um, that we have in the CNCF. Thanks, Alex. So I'm going to talk about graduated and incubating story projects. Rook is a graduated project. Rook is an open source cloud native storage orchestrator for Kubernetes. Rook turns distributed storage systems into self-managing, self-scaling, and self-healing storage services. Rook supports multiple storage solutions each with a specialized Kubernetes operator to automate management. It has stable support for Ceph and alpha support for Cassandra and NFS. The next one is uh, Vitas. It's also a graduated project. It's a cloud native database system for deploying, scaling, and managing large clusters of database instances. Currently, Vitas supports MySQL, Pakerna and MariaDB databases. It's architected to run as effectively in a public or private cloud as it does on dedicated hardware. It combines and extends many important SQL features with the scalability of a NoSQL database. ETCD is a graduated project. It's a distributed key value store that provides a reliable way to store data across a cluster of machines. All Kubernetes clusters use etcd as their primary data store. It handles storing and replicating data for Kubernetes cluster state and uses the raft consensus algorithm to recover from hardware failure and network partitions. TechKV is a graduated project. TechKV is an open source distributed the transactional key value database built in Rust. It provides transactional key value APIs with asset guarantees. The project provides a unifying distributed storage layer for cloud native applications. It can also be deployed on top of Kubernetes with an operator. Uh, Dragonfly is an incubating project. It's also a project under SIG runtime. Dragonfly is an open source P2P based cloud native image and file distribution system. It was originally created to improve the user experience with application cache log image distributions at very large scales. For Dragonfly, no matter how many clients start the file downloading, the average downloading time is almost stable without performance penalties. So that's all for the CNCF storage projects. Next slide, please. So here are a few projects that are in review for incubation. Next. Here is a list of all the storage projects in CNCF. There are a few more sandbox projects shown here. Um, so next, please. 
I'm going to talk about the CNCF storage landscape white paper. In this white paper, we described storage system attributes, different layers in a storage solution and how they affect the storage attributes. We talked about the definition of data access interfaces and management interfaces. Next, please. I apologize there, I hit the wrong button. It's okay. Um, storage systems have several storage attributes, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability defines the ability to access the data during failure conditions. Scalability can be measured by the ability to scale the number of clients, throughput, or number of operations per second, the capacity, and the number of components. Performance can be measured against latency, the number of operations per second, and the throughput. Consistency refers to the ability to access newly created data or updates after it has been committed. A system can be either eventual consistent or strongly consistent. Durability is affected by the data protection layers, levels of redundancy, the endurance of the storage media, and the ability to detect corruption and recover the data. Next slide, please. There are several storage layers that can impact the storage attributes. For example, rather than directly access resources, a hypervisor can provide access to resources, which could add access overhead. Storage topology describes the arrangement of storage and compute resources and the data link between them. This includes centralized, distributed, sharded, and hyperconverged topologies. Storage systems usually have data protection layer, which adds redundancy. This refers to RAID, erasure coding, and replicas. Storage systems usually provide data services in addition to the core storage functions, including replication, snapshots, clones, and so on. Storage system ultimately persists data on physical storage layer, which is usually non-volatile. It has impact on the overall performance and long-term durability. Next slide, please. In this diagram, we can see that workloads consume storage through different data access interfaces. There are two categories of data access interfaces here. We call them volumes and API. Container orchestration system has interfaces for volumes, which supports both block and file systems. In Kubernetes, there are two volume modes, file system and block. File system mode allows workloads to consume a file system directly. Underneath, it can be either a file system or block interface. Block mode allows raw block device to be consumed directly by the workload. On the API, we have object store API that stores or retrieves objects. Note that there is a Kubernetes SIG storage subproject called Cozy Container Object Storage Interface which introduces Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. It also introduces Cozy as a set of gRPC interfaces so that an object storage vendor can write a driver for provisioning, accessing object stores. It is targeting alpha in Kubernetes 1.23 release. On the API, we also have key value stores which use an API to store retrieve values from stores based on a key. It's typically used to store state configuration for distributed systems. And on the API, we also have databases. Databases are typically accessed through an API. Not all databases are cloud native. This can be uh, typically addressed with additional 
tooling like the use of proxies and orchestration systems that allow them to be better suited to run in a cloud native environment. Next, please. Now let's look at orchestration and management interfaces. This diagram shows workloads consume storage through data access interfaces. There are two ways for storage systems to interact with container orchestration systems. The darker green box here, control plane interfaces refers to storage interface directly supported by COs, including container storage interface, CSI, Docker volume driver interface, and so on. CSI has three gRPC services, controller, node, and identity services. Identity service provides info and capabilities of a plugin. Controller service supports functions such as create and delete volume, attach and detach volume, and so on. And node service supports functions such as mount and unmount volume. This uh, orange box is called framework and tools. This is an extension of control plane interfaces. For application API, including key value store and databases, CEOs currently don't have direct interfaces for it yet, but some frameworks and tools have support for them. For example, Rook supports Cassandra. Vitas has an operator to manage MySQL clusters. So that's all for the storage landscape white paper. Now I will hand it over to Alex to talk about the performance white paper. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll spend a few minutes covering uh, the storage performance uh, white paper, which is which is effectively um, a follow on from the landscape white paper that we had put together, where we where we decided to to uh, to focus on some of the different uh, attributes. And the first one we focused on was performance, and the second one was was availability and, and disaster recovery, which which uh, Rafael is going to cover next. Um, in the performance white paper, um, we aim to uh, define a, uh, you know, all of the different concepts that we use for, for measuring performance and benchmarking. And, and we focus primarily um, on, on volumes and databases, you know, in the full knowledge that, of course, there are lots of different systems to, to, uh, to persist information, but, but we, um, we focused on sort of two of the, of the main ones. Um, and in this, you know, when we were looking at it, we, 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 we ended up defining um, a number of things to, to uh, educate end users on, on how to compare benchmarking and, and performance in their environment, primarily because it is such an incredibly uh, complex topic. Um, so, so we look at you know some of the basics where we where we look at um, you know operations and and, and throughput. So things like um, you know IOs per second or perhaps transactions per second in a, in a database or, or or perhaps you know megabytes per second or gigabytes per second even when it comes to throughput. Um, and a lot of those things are very much influenced by um, a number of different uh, factors. So. Of course, uh, when we're looking at operations, um, latency is probably the single biggest um, factor, and and low latency is is um, is going to be key when it comes to uh, anything that involves um, you know thousands of operations per second or thousands of transactions um, per second. Um, but of course, latency becomes less of a factor when uh, you're managing sequential workloads or or, or throughput sensitive um, workloads because it's it's typically easier um, to implement uh, faster throughputs with higher latencies simply because the units of work um, are larger. Um, so so you know often databases uh, database operations, for example. Uh, and small file system operations can be measured in, in maybe 4K or, or, or 16K chunks, but, but sequential workloads like analytics might be operating in, in 1 to 8K or, or 1 megabyte chunks. And so just like um, Xing was explaining in the white paper, a number of different options come into play when it comes to the topology, the data protection, 
uh, data reduction and encryption, um, because all of those services add overhead, um, you know, topology, whether you're accessing data locally or you're accessing data over a storage network, for example, uh, data protection, um, when it comes to comparing the different ways that the data is protected, you know, whether it's um, mirroring or replicas or, 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 or some sort of RAID uh, or even um, erasure coding, for example. Um, data reduction like, like compression and dedupe can also have a huge effect on, on compression, on, on, sorry, on, 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 your, on your performance and, and on the benchmarking capabilities, especially if the data that you're work, the data set that you're working with is, is highly compressible or, or highly dedupable. Um, and of course, you know, encryption for security is a very common factor nowadays um, uh, and, and obviously adds some overhead, but um, in many systems, encryption is 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 highly accelerated um, because it's already catered for in many um, frameworks. Now, the two other things then which which come into play is um, the concurrency. So things like the number of queues and the number of clients that are used to to generate the workload. Um, you know, you have to make sure that um, when we're, when you're looking at the performance, if you don't have um, artificial uh, bottlenecks that might be, you know, CPU bound or or network bound, and and using multiple clients and multiple backends can help with that. Um, and of course, you know, the, the the probably the single biggest thing that that catches so many people out is is understanding the caching um, at multiple layers and 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 making sure that if you want to test the storage performance um, of your of your system um, that you need to, to at least use a data set that's that's um, that's uh, a number of orders of magnitude bigger than the the, the cache size available I, I i lose track of the number of times i've seen um, benchmark documents um, quoting numbers where um, all, all, all that's being quoted is, is effectively the speed of the cache because because the data set isn't actually utilizing the, the storage system at all. Um, so, so you know, in summary, the important takeaway is it's it's really useful to to use the published results um, uh, to, for making comparisons, um, and and therefore <clears throat> our recommendation is uh, to be able to understand. Um, your tests in your own environments with your own um, applications, um, and in the, and in the document we're we're now looking to provide some guidance on the uses of standardized uh, tools, which which effectively would allow you to to perform your own tests uh, in, in your in your own environment and and, and perhaps compare uh, different systems, whether you're running you know, on-prem or in the cloud or, or, or some sort of uh, virtual environment or development environment. And that covers the performance white paper. And with that, I'll hand over to Raffaele, who's going to cover off um, our disaster recovery documents, which we've been working on so hard for the last few months. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah, here we present the uh, disaster recovery uh, white paper. In, in this white paper, we focus on an approach to disaster recovery, which we call cloud native disaster recovery. Um, this is a this is not a new approach, but it's an approach that we think with cloud native um, technologies and and solutions is going to be easier to implement and also more affordable. Uh, that's not to say that you have to use it. It's something that but we think it's something worth considering when you design your disaster recovery uh, architecture. And to define it, we compare and contrast it with what we call transition, traditional disaster recovery approaches. Uh, we, we debated a lot about using this term traditional, and, but just to be clear, by that we mean what you normally find in in, nor, in enterprises, in, in the average enterprise uh, or company. So not what the web scalers are using, not what um, startups that don't have technical depth are using, but on average, what you can find. Uh, and so let's let's take a look at some of these. Uh, uh, dimensions that we use to define the cloud native disaster recovery. Um, for example, what is the trigger of the disaster recovery procedure? Traditionally, it's a human decision. With cloud native, we want 
uh, the decision to be autonomous. So the system knows when it's experiencing a disaster and can react. And then what happens when the disaster recovery procedure is triggered? Uh, what we see in traditional enterprises is a mix, mix of automation and human action. Okay, but the best ones maybe do more automation, other do more human actions. With cloud native, we want everything to be fully automated. So the system sees that there is a problem and self readjusts to the new situation. And then coming to uh, the main metrics by which you mean your uh, disaster recovery SLAs, uh, which are RTO and RPO, uh, recovery time objective and recovery point objective. In transitional disaster recovery, we see uh, RTO, so the time that the system is down between minutes and hours. Um, depending how long it takes to make the decision and how long it takes for the disaster recovery procedure to recover. In cloud native disaster recovery, we want it to be near zero. Uh, it's gonna be in the order of seconds um, because the health sex, the automatic health sex, uh, need to realize what's going on and it needs, they need to redirect the traffic to the LC locations, but it's gonna be order of seconds. And RPO, which is the amount of data that is lost because of the disaster in traditional disaster recovery can be from zero to hours, depending on how you implement your uh, volume replications or your backup system. In cloud native disaster recovery, we want it to be exactly zero. So perfect consistency across all of the uh, disaster failure domains. Uh, and then coming more from a point of view of the process and the process owners so of more people um, than technology um, concerns, uh, normally what we see in traditional enterprises is that the, uh, the storage team owns the disaster recovery process. And technically it's really owned by the applications uh, team which have to publish their own business continuity document. But what happens in reality is that the application teams normally turn to the storage team and ask what is your uh, RTO, what is your RPO, and they adopt whatever is available from the storage team. In cloud native disaster recovery, instead we think that the application team should own, um, should completely own that process. And in, finally, um, doing these experiments and building this architecture, what we notice is that from tr for traditional disaster recovery, usually the technical capabilities that enable the disaster recovery architectures are coming from storage. So th things like backups, restores, and volume sinks. But in cloud native disaster recovery, what we need instead are capabilities from networking. So east-west communication between, between regions or between the, our failure domains and a global load balancer in front of everything to direct the traffic where uh, to the LC locations. Next, next slide, please. So what can you find inside this document? Very quickly, um, you, there is this definition that we just covered, and then we have some definition on uh, concepts that are needed in the rest of the document, like failure domain, HA, DR. We, we're not going in detail on these things. It's just enough to understand the rest of the document. There are books about, the, the, about availability and disaster recovery where these uh, definitions are given in much more details. Then we cover the CAP theorem and everything that comes with it, right? Uh, like consistency, availability, network partitioning. The CAP theorem is the base of uh, why it's, it is possible to realize architecture that, like we described here with the cloud native disaster recovery. Um, so it's something that we need to explain uh, uh, in this document and, and understand uh, to continue to, to, to understand why those things are possible. Then we define, um, we again uh, look at the stateful workloads and their anatomy, similar to what uh, we do in the white paper and the, in the storage white paper. But here we, we focus in on the characteristics of the anatomy that provide um, availability and scalability, which are the concerns for, for disaster recovery here. And then we look at consensus protocols, which is the, are the protocols and the algorithm that are needed to keep all of the instances of a distributed workload in sync. 
so Paxos and Raft for um, uh, consensus uh, between instances that have to do the same action and then uh, through phase commit and three phase commit for synchronization between instances that don't have to do the same don't have to do the same action so they are working on different partitions or different uh, data structures and finally we have some uh, reference architecture for strong consistency and eventual consistency um, so, so cloud cloud native disaster recovery reference architecture in the case you want to do strong consistency or eventual consistency next slide please uh, an example of uh, the kind of research we did in this uh, in this document. These are uh, this is a table with a list of product. Um, these are modern uh, storage um, product or stateful workloads, um, and these are the choices that they make in terms of consensus protocol for keeping the replicas in sync. So replicas have all they have to do the same thing. So they can use Raft or Paxos or some derivative of it, of those two. And then this, the sync protocol or between the shards or the partitions, which are doing different things. So in that case, you use two-phase commit or three-phase commit or some other protocol of that kind. Next slide, please. Uh, here is uh, just the diagrams in the document you can find more explanation, but just the diagrams about our reference architecture for um, strong consistency. Okay, so here, looking at the picture on the left, we have three Kubernetes clusters in different uh, failure domains, disaster recovery failure domains. So that could be data centers or could be cloud regions, right? Depending on your company's definition of risk and disaster, you, you will have maybe a distance that these regions or data center have to be spaced uh, or have to be far apart. Um, so you, you need to set up this kind of um, deployment and then um, you will have a global balancer in front of it uh, to, to direct the traffic, probably a stateless front end and then our stateful workload. Notice that the workload needs east-west communication capability between these clusters um, so that all the instances can find each other and can execute the replica and the sync. And then uh, at the bottom, you see that they use persistent volumes provided by the platform. Uh, and then when, um, so when in this case, when one region goes down, uh, the, the stateful workload readjusts itself with the remaining replicas and the global balancer will detect that the, that one region is not available anymore and send the traffic only to the available regions. Uh, and you don't, lose, you don't lose any data. So RPO is absolutely zero and RTO is just the time that the global balancer takes to, to realize that one region is not available anymore. The, the stateful workloads also needs a little bit of time to readjust itself. Uh, I'm not going to go further in detail on this. Let's let's look at the next slide for for time's sake. And the, the next one is a an event a reference architecture for cloud native disaster recovery, but in this case for eventual consistency. So, in this case, we don't need three regions. We only need two of them. Uh, in in the case, it's a, other than that, the architecture is similar. But in the case we lose a region here. The, the remaining region or the main data center can keep working, but there is the possibility that the two states diverge. And then when when they come back, when, when the uh, disaster is recovered, they will have to converge to an agreed state. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's the characteristic of eventual consistency. We go in, in detail, uh, in more detail on this in the document, and we talk about the fact that eventual consistency does not necessarily mean eventual correctness. So the resulting reconciliation may not be uh, correct from the point of view of the application. But uh, you know, the only thing that the, this, this eventual consistent state of workload will guarantee is that eventually there will be a, they will share, they will have a common view on the state. Um, next slide, please. 
that, that concludes so, this part. So thanks, thanks so much, Rafaela and Xing. Um, so finally, um, a little note to kind of say, please join us. We'd love to, uh, we'd love to have you as part of uh, our community. Feel free to join our meetings or and join the uh, mailing list. And with that, we will say thank you and uh, open the floor to uh, Q&A. Thanks, everyone.